Hey guys, and welcome back to the Ground Up Show. My name is Matt Diavella. This week, great podcast, but first, a housekeeping item that's very important if you like watching this show. I'm going to be moving the Ground Up Show, the video version that is, to a new and separate YouTube channel. From here on out, starting next week, it's going to be found at youtube.com slash ground up show. I've got a link right at the top of the description down below. If you want to subscribe to that right now, that would be great. You'll continue to get the podcast. Nothing's going to change about it. It's just going to be on a new platform. The reason behind it is that every time I upload a video, every time I share something with you guys on this channel or the new ground up show podcast channel, I want you to know exactly what you're going to get. Not exactly the content that's going to be within it, but the platform, the the way that the uh, the message is communicated, the long form conversational style of a podcast is very different from the short edited eight minute videos that I normally make on this channel. So just trying to make it clear, just trying to think in the long term, what's this going to look like in a couple years? Uh, how am I going to be able to grow each of these platforms in different ways? And I imagine. Not everybody that watches my videos here on this channel will also want to watch the podcast. But if you are one of those people, then feel free to go down below right now, click on that link and click subscribe. Thank you guys for watching and enjoy the show. This week, I'm joined by Dan Doty, the founder of Everyman. You've seen him on the Joe Rogan Experience and the Today Show discussing his programs aimed to get men to open up. Today, we discuss the importance of addressing our emotions, what camping over a thousand nights has taught him, and the simplicity and freedom you get by disconnecting into the wilderness. There is something so freeing about not having to choose every goddamn thing every moment of the day. This podcast is ad-free thanks to listener support. Go to patreon.com slash to help keep it independent and get access to exclusive videos on filmmaking and lifestyle design with new content coming every month. Again, that's patreon.com slash Enjoy the show. All right, Dan, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Welcome, man. Excited, Excited to, to chat here. with you. Yeah, like a lot of, lot of topics that I think we're going to get into that haven't quite been covered on the podcast before, so I'm excited about that. Uh, before we get into it, can you tell me just a little bit about the work it is that you do right now? Yeah. I'll, I've given you a proper intro before the show, um, but I think it's always good to hear it in your own words. Yeah, so I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Everyman. Uh, we're an organization that creates the space and the gives the education and the teaching for men to learn how to connect to other humans and themselves by the simple process of being vulnerable, of owning it and understanding what we feel and sharing it with other people, which is a uh, surprise to many women and sort of uh, an interesting thing to say, but it's actually a revolutionary thing for most men to be able to say, you know what, I'm actually really scared right now and I don't know what to do. And to have that simplicity of emotion, um, it's a vulnerable thing. And it's not, thing, it's not, it's not a thing that men are good at but when we do it it creates a uh, human connection that we're all very much needing so it, it seems like it's like happening at a very important time as well yeah. considering everything that's been going on in the past couple years um i mean it's it's when you look at the world 10 15 years ago in terms of a man's role and, and what's expected of a man it's very different or at least it's it's quickly changing it seems like there's this movement of people so who, i think it's actually interesting i think that you know, what What we're doing has been done. We're not the first ones to do this, right? There's been people doing this for a long time. I don't know that the need has actually grown that much. I think it's just come to a boiling point. I think that the, the impact of the harm that men are having on themselves, on other people and the world is just, I mean, obviously it's come to, to a head with the Me Too movement where women, thank goodness, you know, have stood up and said, God, this isn't okay. Like, mm -hmm. No more. We have to step up. So, yes, I don't know that culture has shifted fundamentally, and that's why it's happening. But I do think we've found a seam in terms of uh, timing of when the world's ready. Actually, I was terrified for most of my adult life because I knew I had to do this thing. I knew how I had to step up and say these things and be the guy to share this message. But I was terrified, and I, I was scared of how the world was going to accept it. And I feel like it was just, in a way, I was biding my time impatiently until the world was ready like okay we're ready to 
ready to do this thing. So bring it. Yeah, it seems like that's yeah. a hard thing to talk about, even to your close family or friends, to to be vulnerable. I think, and sometimes it's, it's even harder to be vulnerable with the people that are closest to you. Absolutely, it is because there's a, you have an entire life and relationship of built up meaning, and you have these implicit, not expressed understandings between people that you love, right? And so are you going to rock the boat and just go against them? So that's one of the things. So we have men's groups where men come together to practice. We have retreats, we have wilderness expeditions. And there is something powerful and helpful about going to a place where you're not anonymous because you say your name, but you don't necessarily have these deep built up relational histories with these other people. So yeah, I think I think it's a a lot of what you see happening in our organization is men come in, they learn the skills, they practice, they see how it feels once you've opened up, which is fucking remarkable, and then piece by piece they start to bring it back into their lives and their relationships. So it's literally something that happens all the time is like a man will share something with his group that he maybe hasn't shared or doesn't like to share, is un- uncomfortable to feel and to express, but where he really needs to say it is with his girlfriend. And so the group is there really to practice. It's like a gym. It's like, okay, get it out here. Like get over that first hard step and let's, let's really dial. Like, what do you really feel? Like, let's dig in, like really deeper. What, what is it? And then from that place, you can go home and be, Hey honey, um, I'm not happy with X, Y, Z. And it's, uh, it's, that's kind of how it works organically. I was, it's funny because I was watching a couple of videos on your YouTube channel today and, and some people were just giving testimonials talking about their experience yeah. and somebody was like, uh, I think, did you tell anybody that you were going on a men's retreat? And he said, yeah. I, I told people I was going on a retreat, <laughs> not a men's retreat because yeah. there is something about it and there's even something to me that's very intimidating about that. Totally. I, as somebody who's never done it, as somebody who would be very... Um, I would I would say very open to doing it. Yeah. Um, and even like after just diving deep this morning and watching your TED talk and stuff, and I'm like, shit, I got to do this now. Yeah. This like this. Seems, I mean, as the further you start to get into it, the more you realize that you can get something out of it. Yeah. But there's still I don't know if it's a stigma, but there's something Huge. this resistance that's saying, well, first of all, it's just intimidating to be in a group of other men because yep. you're you, and to be vulnerable in yeah. front of other men men yeah. it just seems like the most difficult thing to overcome is that first step it's true it's a speed bump actually we did a, yeah. a workshop recently a co-ed workshop and a woman gave it i don't remember her name but she gave it the best expression i've ever seen it was like man that that first that first hump it's like a speed bump that you got to get over but when you get over it's like whoa but this is actually okay but it's big you know i would never downplay the the intensity of of how yeah it's it is it's built from a stigma but it's also a very immediate felt sense of fear it it is scary it should be scary especially for men when it's just not how we operate we don't operate that way but you know like i like to contextualize it think about for example, Wim Hof and his ice bath method. Like, you know, breathing a bit and then sitting in an ice cold bath for as long as you can. Man, that's not normal either. That's hard. That's painful, you know. And this is a, for me, the emotional, the vulnerability, this piece, this, it's what I love about it, what I think is helping it catch on so quickly is that although it is scary, the results, it is low hanging fruit. This is the lowest hanging fruit of personal development that I can find anywhere because it is fast and hard and impactful. The impacts are immediate because it taps into our human wiring. It taps into this like this way of being and connection of humans that is, I think, so fundamental and core as social mammals as we are wired. And so when you get there, it's like, oh, man, yeah, this is whoa. Like, Mm. and you know, so it's very impactful and it doesn't take, we have these exercises, you know, where, for example, we, we just kind of make eye contact and share something that vulnerable with each other. And it's, it, it, it causes a cascade of, of like physiology that changes things like like what we do is we practice paying attention to how our bodies feel and paying attention to what emotions we have and so with that awareness as we connect through here it is it's it's almost like um i use the example of like 
extreme sports sometimes like the rush mm. you get the fear and stepping through the fear is really intense it's very real and um but then on the back end of it is just this incredibly healing and helpful yeah, it's, it's funny you, you don't have to walk no shame to tony robbins but you don't exactly have to walk over hot coals in order to have these peak experiences the fact that you can simply just look at somebody and make eye contact dude uh, it's kind of wild that's what i'm talking about yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about yeah it's not that far away it's scary it's not complicated mm. it's like it's not a complicated thing it's it's hard I think in many ways, most people would rather do the Wim Hof jump in an ice bath. (laughs) Well, I think you should probably do both. (laughs) Do both, Honestly. But but here's what's happening already is it's starting to normalize in people's lives. And people are bringing how it's impacting back. And it's just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So I had dinner with someone last night. And so the basic process we do, we call it a check-in, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd sit here and I'd say, I'm feeling... um, I'll just share my my experience. What I'm experiencing right right now with you. So I feel... um, I feel like my legs are heavy, my face feels a little drawn downward, I'm tired, Uh, I also feel excited to be here, I'm having fun talking to you, I I like the excitement of of being on the camera, Um, and I feel sad for what's happening in my home, I just had a newborn, my wife is really hurting and is having a hard time, so I feel this pull toward her. and I feel uh, overwhelmed with all the, everything that's been happening lately. Uh, just things have been moving so fast, and I don't feel like I've caught up. All right, so that's just like me sharing what's true for me right now. So people are saying, you know what? My brother and I, when we, when we have a call now, instead of just like shooting the shit and saying things that don't mean anything and doesn't really impact each other, we just said the first minute we're each going to check in. And like from there... And it's like, oh my gosh, so my, my dad and I are doing this. My dad and I are having like virtual coffee as often as we can. And so my dad came to, to a retreat this year and we've, we've opened this line of communication that just means so much. And, I never, and we did never had that in our lives. So I'm kind of rambling here. But what I'm saying is, is like, yes, it is intense at the beginning, but like after a while, it just becomes... Well, why wouldn't we just be more open with each other? Why do we need to keep such a distance between us when it's really what we all want at the end of the day? Yeah, and I see this happen a lot in in relationships, especially very early on. Like you play this game back and forth with the significant other that you're starting to date and it's very tense and nobody's saying how they're feeling, Mm -hmm. like sexually especially. You will never talk about what's going on in the bedroom. You'll just try to guess. Yeah. figure out what they want and you do that across every aspect of that relationship in the beginning for the most part and i remember uh early on i, I learned the hard way mm-hmm. from just early relationships and screwing up dramatically by not talking about how i was feeling trying to understand how they're feeling so then in my, in my current relationship with my fiance it was from the beginning stumbling into the most uncomfortable conversations yeah. like stumbling not really understanding how right. to enter it but like Let's just start this thing. I feel really weird about this conversation, yeah. but I would feel even more weird and I'd feel even more uncomfortable if we never got there. And right. I, think, I think a lot of people have just trouble just basically communicating and having uncomfortable conversations. Totally. And so for me, there's, I, I guess there's four things that come up, but I'll just say one. And that is one of the reasons that it's difficult to have those conversations. I mean, there's a lot, right? There's, you know, not wanting to hurt other people, fear of judgment, all the all of these things. You can, you can name a hundred things. But one of the things that we also do is we often are very unpracticed at feeling difficult emotion, especially with another person, right? So a lot of times those things, when we have an argument or we have that tension in a relationship, is because the actual physical, somatic, like physiological experience we're having and the emotional experience we're having is really uncomfortable for us, right? And we do all these things as humans to off shoot, offload that and go around it and jump over it and hide it and push it down and all these things. But it, so it, but it really is. It's nothing more than a skill. It's a learned and practiced skill to be like, oh, God, okay, here's, I'm going to actually feel what I'm feeling and I'm going to let you know. And when there is the ability to create a safe understanding between people to do that, it's just like right through it, Mm -hmm. right to it. 
like how much of our life energy and time are we spending skirting around shit, man? Like, you know, um, so there really is a skill component, you know, and it's it's like, you know, in some ways I consider what we do kind of like a almost like a technology of human relating or a technology of human connection. And, you know, so we can kind of run programs to create safety, you know, we mm. can we and so our basic formula is we slow down first all right so we're not going to engage in these conversations when shit's crazy we're going to slow down intentionally come together um speak from our experience because as soon as you jump out of speaking from your experience and you talk about your um opinions or your judgments things like that it makes it possible and more probable that it's going to be fighting for territory and things but if you speak from your experience if you're just like i'm really sad I'm really scared. Nobody, nobody can really t- argue that or take that from you, right? Speaking from experience is the way to uh, cr- connect and create the safety. So, mm. I think uh, that in the same way that you said, people have a speed bump about just going to a man's group or yeah. joining one of these communities. Uh, in the same way, you, you, there's a speed bump into having that first difficult co- conversation with a partner, totally a business partner, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and then once you do that, does each one after it just get a little bit easier? Does like the friction start to <sighs> yeah. wear away? Yes, for the most part, I would say that's that's mostly true. I do think that um, it still is scary. I mean, to to be vulnerable, I think has an edge to it. Um, through a, I would say for myself, so I've been doing this for a long time. Yes, it's gotten a lot easier, you know, like, um, and each step along the way, there seems to have been like another layer of the onion where I'm like, oh my God, I have to do that. I have to be vulnerable again now in this place with this person, with this feeling, because we have many layers of things inside of us that, you know, we either don't want to address or we don't want to feel. So it's not like a, yeah, it's not a quick switch that all of a sudden, oh, I'm free and vulnerable <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. But um, so we think of it, I think of it as a practice, you know, just as like, just like anything else, like meditation or working out or anything else. It's um, the, the reason that I feel like people are really being drawn to it again is the, is the impact is um, intensely noticeable. Mm. The benefits, it's not like a, you know, some people start meditating like, oh, I think I feel a little, you know, more peaceful or something. But it's like, no, it's like my relationships are shifting dynamically and powerfully and I'm receiving the human connection that I need fundamentally. Um, so it's powerful. There's something about, I think, being in a group full, whether it's, I imagine it's very similar men and women in a group of men or in a group of women. Because uh, I was just talking to my partner about this, that it gets you to... It's, it's, it's hard to explain, but I remember growing up in high school, we would have poker. I would be in groups of boys and men all the time. Yeah. Like 10, 15, it was very common. We would yeah. play poker, we'd yeah. have late night slumber parties, whatever. Yeah. And then as you grow up and like in college, you still have that a little bit. It becomes more co-ed in yep. college. And then once you leave college, all your relationships become one-on-one. Uh, let's go out and get some coffee. Let's mm. get a drink. You're not having these the, these group dynamics anymore. And then you get a family. Yeah. And then you're you're more Netflix. Hey, let's Netflix and chill tonight. Let's just stay home. And yeah. it, it becomes more comfortable, and you become more siloed. And you have to really take that extra effort, I think, to be able to continue to you do grow those kinds of groups. And that dynamic correlates with men's mental health uh, decreasing as men get older. Like middle-aged men have the fewest and least deep friendships of any uh, subsection of our population. And who's killing themselves? Middle-aged men. You know, like it's a vital nutrient to our lives to have friendships and connections and i think you're right it's a great question about or a big great point about the the group nature of it right you know mm-hmm. like it's that team we we do programs with army special forces guys and, and we have an integration program where we bring special forces vets in with uh civilians and run programming it's freaking amazing um but you know one thing to note is most i would it's a generalization, but a lot of people in our culture would consider Navy SEALs, Special Forces, Green Berets, these guys as sort of the pinnacle of manliness. 
they live 24 hours a day in teams of men. It's 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 like it, they are so connected to each other. They live a a, a a cooperative life in a way. And so I think that's something that just kind of gets missed in our, you know, it's not just these individual men, like just doing the <laughs> one man thing. It's just, it's not, it, you know, I mean, I don't want to make any, I want, what I want to say is we weren't programmed that way. We didn't evolve that way. For example, I, I was in media for a while and I was part of a group of guys that flew around the world and around the country in the world and went out in the wilderness and hunted animals and filmed it. And it was like a modern day version of a, like a, you know, community's hunting party that went out. And it's just something so, <laughs> so freaking awesome about it. You know, like a group of guys is a really, um, I don't know. It's really important for men's mental health and their overall wellness. How do you guide the the conversations to be more positive? Because I think there's probably, I mean, it's not to say every time men get together, it's all great. And we all talk about our feelings because there are certainly are, uh, when men get together, can that masculinity and or I get at least hostility come out a little bit more? Um, when you have all that testosterone in one place, well, it's interesting. So uh, what would you picture in terms of hostility? Would you picture in terms of like bashing women or, or like what would you? I guess what, you could say, you... yeah, bashing women. You could uh, catcalling because you're yeah. not you don't catcall by your eh, sometimes people do. But yeah. I guess oftentimes catcalling is a is a product of like appearing cool in front of your guys. So my my initial thought on that is that that type of behavior is a defensive surface mechanism that isn't like the heart of the matter. It isn't truly what men are actually feeling. That's that's like a, a mask that is put on um, to look cool, to to gain some sort of uh, rank or some sort of you know perspective from other people, and that so. It, it comes down to intention, right? Yeah, of course, you could get a group of guys together and go drink beer and, and you know, what would they talk about? Like maybe football and their sexual exploitations and things like that, which is, I'm not even going to demonize that. I mean, whatever, it's not all necessarily all bad, but with the intention of getting together to just be honest, right? Let's just call it that, to be truthful, um, you're going to go right through that stuff. And if a guy, you know, is kind of hung up on, on something, you're going to go right through it down deeper into what's actually happening. And there may be real anger there. And so that's great. So we create a space where, yeah, let your fucking anger out, like actually be angry. Cause that's one of the things I think is actually happening is that real, true, deep anger. We don't have anywhere in our life to express it. And so as it's suppressed and down there, it comes out in these shitty ass ways where we just backbite our partners or maybe, yeah, we, we do. It comes out in some gross, uh, feelings toward women or toward whatever, you know? And so it's just this like uncomfortable leaking of shitty, stinky energy, you know? But when the, when you can get down into it and say, Oh yeah, fucking let it out, man, mm. get it out. Like let it like, you know, cause feelings and experiences and emotions, they don't go away. They don't dissipate. You know, you can't suppress things down and keep adding to them and just expect that they're just going to like, what like dissolve disappear it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. right because i got you've mentioned this before though too in in that i guess historically men were protectors of yeah. families of communities yeah. uh and now you, you have that in maybe the military and in certain disciplines but for the accountant <laughs> So I started doing this working with adolescents, right? Mm -hmm. And these adolescents were really struggling and hurting and causing harm to their families. And it was just like, I couldn't help but think, like, why? What is, what's going on here? Like, these are amazing. Like, I would get out there, I'd connect with these kids and be like, God, you're fucking amazing. Like, you're an amazing human. You're a kid. Like, I, I like you're awesome. And it just sort of naturally started to see. So like parents would come for parent weeks or dads would come out. I'd lead a trip with boys and their dads. And it was just like, Oh, like not on purpose, but our inability to uh, get through our own shit spills onto our children, spills onto our wives. Like, I think that men's 
willful or subconscious ignoring of our own repressed emotion, trauma, feeling, stress, suffering is a huge cause of harm in our in our world on many different la- scales, right? So like rape being rape suicide like being the dark scary intense violent ones but then even just like a father who uh has a hard time really being present for his kid like imagine that's like that's kind of like the blanket story that's like what has happened almost globally right Mm -hmm. and so the ability to start peeling back some of those um, relating thing. Like, I mean, we need when we grow up. I'm a dad now. I have two little boys, right? A two week old and a two year old. And it's more apparent than anything in the world to me that they need me to be there, not just physically, not just financially, but just like with them. They need me to look in their eyes and hold them and play with them and give them my love fully. And men in our culture have not been showed, trained, taught to show up and be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just sons, right? It's daughters. It's it's partners. It's like we are holding, we are withholding our humanity from the world. That's funny. That reminds me of uh, Bill Burr has a a bit on just how men just push it down and further down and down until eventually they just explode. Yeah, and that's what happens all the time. I you know I see it in friends. I see it in parents. It, it it's not. It's more common than it is uncommon to see people just holding back how they truly feel. Yeah, I you know I've been kind of sitting on this for a while, but I believe that we're at the very beginning, the first rustlings of a of a I mean you take like the you know sort of nutrition world or the paleo movement of trying to get back to a more natural way to eat or minimalism and a more natural and human oriented way to to live with stuff and things I really believe that we're about to enter an era where we talk about our our, our internal and relational statuses in in the same kind of frame in how are we actually wired to to healthily relate to each other and how you know so that means everything how to parent how to and this is going i'm not saying it's just starting but i do think that our culture is i think it's a necessary and almost organically unstoppable next step Uh, we were talking a little bit before the podcast about uh minimalism and simplicity and as it relates to kind of living in the wild and yeah. getting more connected with nature. How do you view that? Because I know a lot of people, when they think about minimalism, they think of Walden living in a cabin yeah. in the middle of the woods. And I know that's definitely something that's very close to you. And it's something that you've yeah. spent a, a, much of your life connecting with. So, yeah. and, and for me personally, as somebody who grew up middle class family, not really lived next to a farm, but not really too connected with nature. Yeah but also going on these getaways to my parents' cabin in the middle of the woods and experiencing that. But now as an adult living in a major city, feeling often deprived of a connection with nature. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just sharing before we started that I feel I've been trying to quantify accurately how many nights I've slept on the ground. Basically. Um, it's, it's in the thousands for sure. And, uh, the first things that jump out about that is I loved from an early, early age, like being in the woods, being on a river, being outside. It was it just it just made me deeply happy, just like naturally. My mom would take me on these walks and we lived in North Dakota where there, it was basically just farm country. It was flat. It was it was not a nature area right but there were some rivers we would walk these shelter belts shelter belt is a line of trees that farmers plant between fields to keep erosion down from wind so the wind doesn't come here and pick up all your topsoil but we would walk down these shelter belts together and i just remember how happy it made me and um yeah so after college i became a wilderness therapy guide and i spent Mm -hmm. a handful of years um leading groups out in the woods and you know what it really did for me first was it just started I used to joke that I didn't need a therapist because I had a sleeping bag and that really meant something to me and it still does when I say it and what I feel like it inevitably did was uh, start to thaw me out 
like the just the connection the slowness the and i would even say i don't need to get into this but i do think that there's something about i think there's something to the idea maybe you heard of like the earthing practice they do in japan in japan or just the actual contact with Mm -hmm. nature like you know without cement and shoes and everything in between us i think there's something there about being grounded and being in in touch honestly um but yeah man like you know going out for 21 days with a backpack where you have all of your food um well 21 days is, is a lot of food for once so usually you get like a st- stage so maybe eight days of food at a time whatever mm-hmm. whatever but um you know drinking out of a river or a lake you know pitching your tarp like a lot of this i didn't even sleep a tent it was under the stars or under a tarp um I mean, think about that. I mean, think about this, you know, beautiful home we're in with all of the things, but the the shift to literally a tarp you can fold up into this thing and it weighs like a couple ounces. Like that's your shelter. That's your home. It just makes me so wildly happy even just to say that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And the like the kind of food you eat out there, you know, like you you eat oatmeal every morning. You maybe have freeze dried food or something so simple that you that you can rehydrate with water or that you can cook in a few minutes. Um, what an immense amount of freedom! I mean, like we could we could flip up our phone and order any cuisine in the entire world right now and have it delivered to us in a half hour. Fuck that! How like how like I get how good that is and I like that too, <laughs> but like. There is something so freeing about not having to choose every goddamn thing every moment of the day. Like, it's overwhelming. You know, we think about our how we evolved as humans. I mean, what, the way we live now is so wildly out of the norm from what was possible before. So there's something about the regularity and the simplicity of that. I mean, and that's just even, that's just one element of this. What really struck me about all the wilderness work was how we begin to relate as humans away from all the distraction, away from the noise, away from the other connection. And, you know, it's literally like making the decision to, uh, in a way it's very similar to what we do at every man. We just intentionally like, come together to really see each other right but i mean if you go out in the wilderness with six people like so far away from anybody else i mean you can't escape each other because you need each other to do what you're doing and you can't like duck out of your relationship so i've I've done quite a few experiments and i'm trying to do more and more of them in terms of relationship with technology where i recently did a 30-day social media detox which is to just to take a step away from it because yeah. we think it's so important. We think it's when we're caught up in it and when we're checking every single day incessantly, uh, a lot of times we become trapped yeah. within it. Yeah. And I'm curious about your relationship with technology in that way because it seems like you need it in terms of what you're doing in terms yeah. of to spread a message and to talk. You have a podcast and mm-hmm. very much connected with technology, but also understand that actually separating from it will give you uh, more clarity. Yeah. I'm actually wrestling with that like immediately right in my immediate life right now. I feel um, I'm as addicted as anybody, yeah. you know, I'm on a screen as much as anybody out there. And, um, but what I, I spend a lot of time. So I have a, I have a, uh, a meditation practice that's very important to me and it's all about feeling the the experience my body's having it's a body-based meditation style and so if i don't pay attention to to my screen time and my social media time um you know i just get caught up and it's just that but when i when i can like slow down a little bit and start to feel how i feel as i do it it's gross <laughs> Yeah, it's a gross like I can feel it even right now kind of in the pit of my like kind of in my sternum area. It's like, oh, this is like a weird addiction where you're not in control of what's happening. And you're I can feel the need for the hit of serotonin or whatever it is, you know, and a little like pop, not even the like, but more the comment, I guess. Gets well, that's, a little that's stronger. It. Yeah, because I was doing some know? research on it, too. It's yeah. it's actually the anticipation in which we're addicted to. Yeah. It's the feeling of like, ah, like I need because yeah. it's very 
it's not that often that the content itself pays off with the no. expectation of what you're hoping to get out of yeah. it. Because it, it's one in a hundred. It'll be yeah. an amazing opportunity. The Today Show has an email for you. And you know what I mean? Totally. It's those amazing bursts yeah. that you're like, oh, it's worth it to just check. Oh, maybe something else came in. And we get so caught in that feedback loop that it's it's really difficult to break. It really is. So for myself, you know, I, I make sure to unplug daily. Um, or almost daily, you know, I try mm-hmm. to do daily, a, you know, full hour of meditation to, to really not it. Well, so, but here's the thing too. I think it's, you know, it's not just social media. I can feel it on a spectrum too. It's like, you know, I don't know. Yesterday I was really just tired and kind of down and struggling. And, you know, I just was like, Oh, who am I going to call to make me feel better? You know? And, I did. You know, I go like it was early morning. I couldn't sleep. And like called five people, nobody answered. I just and then I'm like, all right, man, just fucking sit down. So I just sat down on a bench in, in downtown LA. I was like, yeah, I feel pretty shitty right now. They did this research study where they had people uh, in a room, and you could either sit there by yourself or get a mild electric shock. Right? I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. And most people, men actually, Chose were more inclined to, to, to do it. It was like 60, 70% men clicked yeah. it. And maybe 20 to 30% women clicked Isn't it. Isn't that insane? Uh, it's crazy. Just because we, we can't sit still with yeah. our own thoughts. And I imagine this was even before technology. I think this is just something that we have we try to distract ourselves. We try to just keep busy. We not only try, we do it. We do. We're very successful <laughs> oh, at man, it too. Good at that, yeah. Uh, but I think that you, right, you have to start looking in, and you have to start identifying um, how you feel. So that's the bigger practice: not yeah. only identifying, but letting yourself do it. Mm. Letting yourself do it. That's actually the deeper practice here. It's not just sharing. It's not just talking about it. It's actually feeling it. That's the harder thing. Like, can I let myself feel? like uncomfortable and sad can i let myself be inten- intensely angry right those i mean that's the that's the harder thing that's the, like it's not just like i'm i'm sad but and there's neurology to, or neurobiology to back this up right so mm-hmm. just very simply uh the ability to identify and name your emotion is is you're able to basically disarm larger cascades of deeper emotions so at the beginning or with mild to medium level emotions or feelings Naming it, like feeling it, naming it basically is like, oh, okay, I don't have to ramp this up. I don't need to escalate, right? So name it to tame it is the first one. Feel it to heal it is sort of the deeper level, right? So, and that's what we do at our retreats. That's what we do in our group is like, not only are we going to talk about this, but hey, man, it's okay. Like, you don't even have to talk right now, but let yourself be really angry let it let it be there and then when you're moved to say something from that place do it you know um and here's what happens which is deeply beautiful and so let's shift it let's say just to sadness or loss or grief right so mm-hmm. say um let's see if i can get an example in my life um well let's say loss of a relationship right and so you lose a relationship and um what would you imagine would come up sadness you know maybe fear of being alone distraught whatever that is and um you'd say you don't have a therapist and maybe you have some friends but maybe don't let yourself go all the way open with your emotions you come to a men's group and the guys are just there for you and you know you say that you're hurting about this and uh they just affirm what you're feeling. It's like, yeah, and we're here with you as you feel this. And so there's this ability to let go into the actual emotion that's been pent up. And, you know, it's just naturally you kind of sometimes tumble or fall into this outpouring of emotion where you can just sit there and, you know, have a good cry or, or, or let yourself just what, like our emotions are natural things. They, they have this process. It's like digestion almost, you know, they like, they need to have their moment and then they go and then they pass. Like it, it is real. And so that's why the fact that men don't go to therapy, generally speaking, it's improving, um, and don't have these deep level of friendships. That's, um, you know, I think there's multi, faceted ways to approach this problem but 
um, a group is really, it's just really powerful. It's, it's, it's like amazing maintenance. You know, I still I have a group myself in my community and it becomes the anchor of my week. You know, it's just like, it's like a, it's a gut check. It's a head check. It's a feelings check. And like, not only is it a place for me to like sort of catch up and let out what I've been suppressing. Cause I, I mean, listen, man, I mean like a fucking human and suppress <laughs> still the majority of what I feel, <laughs> even though I'm dedicating my life, you know, to help not do this. Um, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Is there, is there something to, uh, do some of us sometimes overfeel and, and harp on things that we should be letting go of? Um, say, if we continue to relive an, a, a bad experience or a traumatic yeah. experience, is there a point where we should say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to step away and let go of this and not let it define my life anymore? Well, that's such a good question. And I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to answer this with authority. I'm just going to ex- answer it from experience. Um, I believe that there is a lot of looping that occurs, you know, or re-traumatization sort of circling and, and, and going into an experience or a feeling that's there. Um, I do believe that with the right guidance and support that you can drop into that experience and, have the support to go a little bit further with it, a little deeper to a place that's, I, I do believe most of those can be say completed or mm-hmm. healed. And one of, so one of the missing things, and, and this is sort of under underlies a lot of therapy and a lot of just human connection protocol stuff is that our brain, when we, when we re-experience say a trauma while fully connected and cared for by somebody. So say we were here, you know, I'm fully present with you and you were able to go through that experience. There is, there is the ability to shift and change and heal that neurobiologically. That's one of the sort of deeper, simple underpinnings of therapeutic process and things. It's just that you're not alone in this this time. I'm going to be here with you. And that changes things. It really does. So, I think it is, um, the question is, should I step away from something? Um, at times, yeah, probably, definitely. You know, and I don't know what that means and, and whether that's necessarily possible. But, you know, if that means that um, I get, you know, I know that stepping into a certain community of people like sets me down this this course of action, like of struggle, should I not go there? Yeah, probably, you know. But with the right guidance and support, could I use those triggers to go deeper through it and actually come to a place of healing and resolution where my body's no longer holding on to it? I think that's absolutely possible too. Hmm. If somebody wanted to find a men's group, where do they go for it? Everyman.com. E-V-R-Y-M-A-N.com. And how does it work? So we have uh, probably about 100 groups around the country and the world right now. And uh, you just put in your zip code or your town and search and it'll pop up whether there's a group near you. Mm. If there's not a group near you, we have a simple process to start your own group. We have curriculum, we have mentoring, we have a, we have support to help you get it going. It doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take any training to start this. It takes willingness. It really takes just being willing to like step in and be vulnerable and lead by example. Um, so, and there's other organizations out there too. And actually we're championing all other well, I should say most other men's men's organizations too. Mm. And I mean, listen, what I would say is like, um, whatever feels like you feel okay enough to go, like go find a therapist. Seriously. Talk to your just one buddy and say, Hey, would you maybe be willing to like, I don't know, like share a little bit more about what's actually going on, you know? Do that you know do whatever how does the the process work say like say i join up to a a men's group Mm -hmm. i'm just curious to understand like how does that look like is it like once a month meetings once a week or usually weekly yeah usually weekly i recommend weekly uh to anywhere between two to four hours i think the sweet spot usually ends up being two and a half or three hours long Mm -hmm. um it's usually six to ten guys i think that's a healthy size group they, we meet all, I mean, wherever guys can meet, just a private, quiet space. Um, 
And no alcohol, no poker, or generally is it just sitting around a table? Yes. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, it's, I guess yeah. it's suggestions. And our then recommendations. <laughs> our recommendations is that um, you. It is basically like a, a circle of chairs, right? And it's yeah. and it's. Uh, we have a process, and it, and it's. We have like a, a. You come in. You have a first check in. Like you know, everybody just kind of says where they're coming from, what they're feeling. And then everybody gets a good chunk of time every night, whether it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever your time allows for, to really be heard and to go into what you're feeling and really have that opportunity. And then usually there's time at the later. If somebody's really struggling with something, you set aside a half hour toward the end to really, you know, give a guy some time and attention. And I think from the outside, you know, yeah, you're like, wow, we're going to talk for three hours the actual stress for groups is is that they never have enough time to actually go all the way to where the the problem in reality is the opposite um yeah so you know again we don't have any hard and fast rules here like if you want to drink a beer go for it but our recommendation would be try this first try it without see how it feels to sit down no phones no booze um no other activities i mean that's the whole point right it's the the whole point is like be present with each other, you know, really sit down and let yourself be there all the way. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I get, I do really get, even though I've been doing this for long, I get how weird it may come across at the beginning. And, you know, there's no, uh, it's not, this isn't normal in a lot of ways. Right. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's the best things. The best things aren't normal. Yeah. Like if, what's the alternative just continue to drudge through whatever you're exactly held up on the other amazing thing so here's just an anecdotal example so i started a men's group when i moved to montana um which i was still at that point in my life i was still terrified to start my own group that's that's how much i understand how scary this stuff is like as little as like three or four years ago i was like oh my god what are people gonna think of me and but here's what happened eight guys committed uh within six months i think five of the eight guys had started their own dream business the project that they were like waiting on holding on so it's not Mm. just about like the outpouring of emotion it's like all of a sudden you have a place to put out there like who you are and what you really want and the natural reaction is guys are like Fuck yeah, of course you have to do that. What are you like what are you waiting for? Like we're here for you. And there's the natural support, the natural sort of power behind yourself is massive. And so all of a sudden you're not doing life alone and these things that you oh man, I would love to, you know, God, I would love to really write for a magazine one day and but you never have like enough you know, I don't know, energy coming in to really push you to do it. All of a sudden, every single week, you're sitting down with seven or eight guys that are like, dude, of course you got to do it. Do it. What do you want? What, how can I help? And it's, so it's not only just the, so we kind of think about it in terms of like the, there's a part of getting like, like a level set, like to a place of being okay. And then from that place of okay is where things get really interesting. It's like, what do you want to build, man? What do you want to create? How do you want to live? And that is fun and exciting. Yeah. I feel like you need, you need other people to be able to push you and to to encourage and push each other. And I know like myself, I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself, just set out with an idea to create something. It's I need other people to bounce ideas off of. I need other people to tell me that I'm not crazy. And it sounds like when you have a group like this, that's actually supportive and that's not, they're not idea killers. They're like, yeah, that's great. Do it. Because that's what it all, it's all about. It's all about just a learning process. Well, and it's the space where people can be honest, where, where if you can say your dream or whatever, but it's but you can also have guys, if it isn't, if it doesn't like feel right to other people, they can say, whoa, <laughs> is that, I mean, I don't know. Is that really going to work? And that, but the thing is that rarely happens, but to have that ability for honest feedback, yeah. God, man, I launched every man. I created every man with the support of my group. Like they backed me, man. Like, you know, like they just like, they're like, yes, do it every week. And, you know, and that's part of the reason that having the regularity of like a weekly group is so powerful because we can run away from ourselves so easily, you know? So say if it's, and we do say that when you're in a group, like you, 
you're going to commit to this. You're going to come every week, right? Because otherwise, you know, like if it's super an optional thing, like our subconscious is going to push us or maybe it's our, I don't know what part of us, but the fear of like, it's scary to do what we really want to do. Right. And so this, this tendency we're talking about where we evade or ignore, like that can be really powerful. So like, we'll be like, Oh, I'm really just not feeling well. I'm not going to come to my men's group tonight could actually be derived from a place of like, God, I'm like really terrified to take this next step in my business, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's just kind of like the understanding that our behaviors are often driven by deeper things. And when we regularly sit down with each other and allow that to actually clarify where our behaviors are coming from, it's really powerful. So there's accountability is one of the major like gifts. Yeah. these groups. I imagine it's one of those things where once you get into it, you realize, I wish I was doing this five years ago, 10 years ago, right? Totally. Because like there's so many, I look back to a younger version of myself with so much social anxiety, worry yeah. and doubt about starting something, yeah. creating a podcast or whatever it is, becoming yeah. a filmmaker. And if you, if you had other people there, I think that could help lift you up and support you on a continual basis. You could get so much further. Seriously, like that is it is it's like when young men step into our groups in their early mid 20s It's like, oh my goodness, man. Do you know what you're gonna be able to create in your life? Mm. Do you have any idea how incredible it is that you're here? And I got lucky too I stepped in my first group when I was 27 Which at that time or for me it felt young like all the guys in the group were in their 30s and 40s Um, It is true. Mm. It really is and you know, and I don't have any illusion that the, like a men's group is like the only form of this, but like the bigger it message is like, come on, let's like, we're humans. We're social, social mammals. Like let's do this together. Like I, I don't, I got to find the quote or the thinker that I saw this, but basically an idea that human genius truly comes from collaboration like the like the big things like we have this idea that it's just one person's brain that that truly um are the things to honor or celebrate the most but the reality is that none of us are an island right and what i so as i see every man sort of take off and emerge um you know it's not me you know this is this is not me but like our team and the way that we uh, like the synergy between us and the amazing creativity that comes between us, it's it's multiplic, you know, many multiples, many many. Like I don't even know how to quantify, but many multiples more powerful, and like to just implement that in our life on a regular basis is a game changer. That's great. Uh, you want to wrap up with a couple quick questions here? Yeah. Uh, these are quick questions, not quick answers. And the first one is kind of something we just touched on. But if you could look back at a, at a younger version of yourself, say around 20 years old, yeah. um, and not tell yourself to do something differently, but just provide yourself some advice, what would that advice be? Oh, good. Um, well, it would. I think I would have kick-started this process, and I would have said, Hey, you have some emotions in there. The sooner you get access to them, the sooner things are going to move forward. Uh, Another piece of advice would have been, you're probably too young for thinking that long-term monogamy and like relationship is, is the best way to live right now. Um, I would have tried to get ahead of some pain that I felt and caused in my twenties through relationships. Um, but on the honest answer to that is I was very fortunate. I had some mentors in my life that they didn't ever really give me advice, but they somehow gave me permission. So I think my 20 year old self, I was, uh, in college, I was doing an anthropological field study in Ecuador with this incredible man named Jim Belote and his wife, Karen, and like sitting in the back of this bus, you know, driving through the mountains of Ecuador and him saying like, yeah, you want to like, you want to like go live in Mongolia for, for six months and like, you know, hike through the mountains and live with tribes. He's like, yeah, you should do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, just like <laughs> gave me permission to have adventures, you know? So, um, I feel like I was really well cared for in terms of advice and, and mentorship. And he's just one example of many. Mm. You know? Well, that's just a great point though. Cause many of us feel like 
this this sense of we're going to miss out on something if we maybe take a trip abroad or we live somewhere for six months that's mm. just completely off the grid. We feel like, well, if I don't do that, then I'm going to miss out on, you know, starting my career, making money yeah. and all that stuff. And it's like, you got plenty of time to do that shit. Yeah. So, so this was here. Let me share it this way. This was the advice or somehow came to me for whatever reason. I got to my, live my twenties by just literally following my I just I just somehow got to fucking live like I lived in Panama I lived in Ecuador I did this wilderness work I'd save up money I'd travel all over the world and for whatever reason I guess I I guess I just in some ways I didn't necessarily have a specific professional ambition yet but I was allowed to just live my life and have experience and so for for people in their 20s for young people that's often the advice that I give now is like hey like I'm kind of an adult now. Let me give you a preview. Like getting like it kind of sucks. <laughs> and mm-hmm. go live. Like go do what you want to do. Learn who you are. Like this system, this system is waiting for you when you either need to or feel really called to participate in it. But go explore. Go have ex- experience is like the bottom line for for me. It comes down to experience. Like and I think, you know, in age, I'm just I'm either the oldest millennial alive or I'm almost a millennial. But I feel like the the lean toward experience and meaningful experience is is I mean it's it's not anything you know that's not said now. That's what millennials want. Mm-hmm. Um, well, how old were you when you started Everyman? It was two years. It was 18 months ago. 2017. I was 35. Yeah, I was 35. I think that a lot of people they do they feel like you can't start something this late in life. And have it be a lot of people feel like, well, I'm too old now. I'm 40 years old. I'm 45 years old. Like, yeah, I, I can't I can't start it. Like, why? Why now? And it's like it doesn't take that long. <laughs> you know, it's that's that's a question. Many people I would say great many, many, many percent high percentage of people would have some version of that. Like my dad came on a retreat earlier this year. But for years I've been inviting him. And, you know, I think there was a sense of like. I just I missed the boat on this like mm. it's too much it's too late I missed it but like it's just kind of bullshit for any of that I mean it's it's either you it's either you, you like you honor the truth you have inside you or you don't I think it really comes down to that no matter how old you are no matter what's going on and I get that life's complicated you know like and I've it's I want to be super transparent like I started this company as I started a family. I have two young sons and financial like security has been like the last fucking thing that we've had. And it sucks. Mm. It's been really hard. Um, So yeah, man, I mean, there's far more practical people than me that I think you should listen to also. But um, (laughs) I think my wife and I are well practiced at jumping off cliffs. And in fact, actually in real life, we both actually hate that. Like we're afraid of heights and I don't like, (laughs) but in terms of, you know, taking risks to follow what, what we really feel is true. Like we're, we're pretty into that. What was the tattoo you said you'd get all at once, all at once, (laughs) (laughs) not by choice. (laughs) And I mean, I'm changing it. I'm officially declaring that no more all at once. And now it's step by step. Step It's just a little bit overwhelming right now. Everything we moved, we had a new baby that like every man is taking off. It's just like, Whoa. I feel you. It's, it's, I think sometimes we, we take on too much responsibility and we, we think we need to do, everything at once when in fact we can drop stuff but it's hard to drop things yeah it is because because the stuff that you're doing now you 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 care about it you you enjoy every single aspect so you couldn't imagine well how could i slow down my business yeah but in a lot of ways we we don't have a choice because it's either you're going to grind yourself down to the bone and not enjoy anything or you're going to enjoy the few things that you do have totally totally yeah so i have surrounded myself with a team of smart practical folks too you know so there's a balance to be found um i think that's actually a key too just in like running a business and growing right finding people you can trust and people that you can delegate to and and yeah so we're starting to we we run our team based on the principles of our groups and so that trust is Mm. something that we dive deep into and take completely seriously and we're also starting to do corporate work and helping teams and 
based on our principles because it really yeah. is a very effective way to build trust and maintain it. That's fascinating. Because, yeah. yeah, I would imagine if I were to hire an employee now, I wouldn't have one-on-one -on -one <laughs> deep dive conversations with them. But that's probably something that would be very important, especially if you're trying to build a cohesive Unit. Yeah, and it's a little different, you know, in the yeah. in the professional setting. I mean, you know, it's not sure, we're, we're not piece. we're not going to like heal each other's trauma necessarily in that, but there is a level of like baseline can my human self, can my nervous system trust you? Can do we have safety? Can we create safety here where we can interact and be honest and and like yeah, think about it. We I was just talking about this the other night, but like the amount of people that for example, if your boss sort of mistreats you or something like gives you a hard time, like that can really like that hurts deeply and long, right? And that, that's not just like a little thing. Like you go home and you're stressed out and maybe you sleep poorly and you, you know, you either take it out on other people or you just kind of suffer by yourself. Like our work relationships because of the amount of time we spend there are massively impactful on our health and our life and our well being. And so, yeah. So what if we could just establish work communities that allow for, Hey boss, I don't, feel very this doesn't feel right to me i feel and i feel scared to tell you this but blah 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 mm. right just that that sort of honoring human my partner uh lucas crump calls it that you know a lot of these companies are it's actually inhumane the way people interact professionally it's inhumane and um so yeah what we're working on in the, like, the corporate and team space is how can we create more uh deeply human environments and, and i think it's 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 putting the people first too because i've seen it just from things that i hear about i've, I've never really had a typical nine to five job yeah but it's amazing when you hear about managers and bosses who value their employees more than the company itself yeah who say hey listen uh i just want to be honest with you you know you may want to you know I think that you might be able to grow further in a different company. Yeah. Or maybe, hey, there's yeah. this opportunity at this other company and I can give you an introduction if you want. Totally. Like that's the kind of thing that I think the selflessness, yeah. just trying to take care of each other and not yeah. really being like, well, then my performance review is not going to look very good. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Totally. Well, and the thing I would want to say there too is there's room for balance, right? So yeah. say you have like a team at the head of a company and one person is looking out for the bottom line and the second person is looking out for a new bottom line, which is the human interaction with the understanding that when your humans are taking care of their performance, their ability to, to, to impact. So like there is real capitalistic underpinnings here. It's potential. It's possible. I saw Al Gore speak yesterday and this is kind of basically what he was saying is that like, you know, market for forces will at some point shift us into this more humane way of living whether that's environmentally or whether that's interconnectedness with you know humanity mm. like it does seem that we're going to lean that way but it is a whole i mean that's i think one of the reasons it's probably scary you know for for i mean what a business business's purpose is to make money right and so what we need to do and what i think what we are doing is showing that um and it comes back to like what I said about the men's group is like when you have that environment and that place, people like like I said, five out of eight of our guys started their own business within six months. It's like unlocking their creativity, unlocking. And that's one of the issues that I like personally um, before I started Every Man, I felt like I was able to bring maybe 35 percent of who I was to my job. And and thirty five five percent of my personality, thirty five percent of my passions, and probably even though I perform fairly well, probably thirty five percent of my potential. Honestly, this month was a big month for you. Yeah, you had a baby boy. You were on the Today Show, traveling all over the place. Um, how do you face moments of doubt? I imagine both those in your personal and professional career yeah. this past month were tested yeah so how do you enter those positions where you just feel overwhelmed you feel like you're not sure you're going to be able to make the right decision or live up to your own expectations two things um i reach out uh and then i try to do my best just to stick with it whatever's happening so i had a really big moment of doubt yesterday yesterday morning i had just uh, facilitated a workshop at summit in LA for what had been probably designed to be 50 people ended up being 350 people. Um, 
it was a new experience for me. It was scary. I got done with it and I just felt this like big doubt or, or void. Like, was that, did that go well? Did I do okay? And so I went back to my hotel, went to bed, couldn't sleep, was just sort of like, I don't know, caught in a shitty space, you know, and kind of a woke up early, um, felt terrible, felt freaked out, felt scared. And it was doubt. It was like, man, did I screw something up or, you know, was this okay? And, uh, and that's what I think I mentioned this earlier, but I called, I called my wife, called my dad, called my mom. Nobody was awake. I walked around the street, sat on a bench, um, feeling uncomfortable. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, a couple of things I was just like, Oh, I'm just going to sit in here and feel shitty for a while. And then, um, you know, ended up a few people called me back and everybody was like, what I think is happening, Dan, is that you're really just completely fried and you're, you know, you're kind of shut down right now and you're, you know, it's going to be okay. And so I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. Didn't feel better. Then I went on with my day. I went back into the event, um, having breakfast and people started coming up to me and being like, oh my gosh, that was one of the most powerful things I've ever been in. And I was really honestly like, really? <laughs> like, like, thank you for telling me. Like, I need, like, I need a little bit more feedback. Yeah. Um, and as the day went on, everybody was just like, I got so much amazing feedback. And it was, it, you know, the truth of what happened started to filter back to me. And I put myself in the position to, to hear it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you know what it came down to is about like 16 hours of, of just like a really uncomfortable state. Um, but I had people you know, supporting me. I had people, uh, you know, kind of like holding my hand along the way and I just, I kind of got through it, you know, I like worked out to the other side and, um, I got a good night of sleep last night and I'm, you know, I'm feeling, I feel very confident now, you know? So it's a process. I stuck, <laughs> stuck with the process. Well, if you're, I guess if you're not feeling those things, then you're, you're likely not pushing yourself. Yeah. And it's more than a moment of doubt. You know, it's like a, it's a it's wave like, of doubt. That yeah, you have to ride. Yeah, it's like a, yeah, definitely. All right, man. Well, dude, I'm totally sold. Uh, I definitely want to go on a retreat, uh, yeah. with every man. I know you guys do these pretty frequently throughout the year, yep. um, as well as the men's groups. So if, if people are interested in either of those and want to hear more about you, where do we send them? Everyman.com. Yep. You can, um, find our podcast. I do a weekly podcast too. I'd love to have you on sometime. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have our events up there. We have coaching. Uh, so myself and, and, and we have a team of coaches that help men do this one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if a group doesn't feel quite right for you yet. Uh, yeah, our group's on there and everything, everything can be found there. And yeah, I'm super excited about the Today Show appearance. I'm super excited. We have an article in Men's Health coming out uh, this week that a guest of yours, Nate yep. Green, who I love massively, He's amazing. Uh, wrote it. And he and I have become real close. And so, yeah, look out for that too. Awesome. Yeah. Can't wait. Cool, man. Thanks for doing the show. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of The Ground Up Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This podcast is 100% ad-free and is brought to you by Patreon subscribers. If you want to get access to exclusive videos on filmmaking, podcasting, and much more, go to patreon.com slash mattdiavella. Every contribution will also help to keep this podcast ad-free, which is pretty damn awesome. I appreciate your support, and I'll see you next time.